So um, I'll try to breeze through the first half of the, the topics, which is basically just gonna be a brief review of orthopedic exam, get analysis, um, and then talk a little bit in detail about medical management for most of these cases. Um, I'm then gonna go into a little bit more detail about trauma management, particularly in the cases of young dogs um, having you know, growth plate fractures and things like that. And then um, go a little bit more into trauma management. And then as far as referral and kind of, you know, the talk that I have with owners when they have, you know, puppies with fractures or, you know, kind of giving them real, realistic expectations for those things. Um, and then I'll jump into covering a bunch of the different diseases. Um, again, there's gonna be a lot of information in there and I won't go into a ton of detail with every single one, um, but there's certainly a lot of places to springboard off of if you're looking for more information. So any good orthopedic exam starts with a good orthopedic history. Um, if you're lucky enough to have enough assistants or technicians there, are, these are things that they can start asking the owners when they're admitting them and, uh, and starting the appointment. Um, and they can, you know, or even turn this into a forum where they're basically helping kind of get your brain starting to organize where you think this disease is gonna be and you know, what's most likely for their, their signalment. Um, and so important things in, in any orthopedic history are signalment, you know, which limb the owner thinks is affected, which is not always the limb that is actually affected. Um, has there been recent trauma? Is this waxing or waning? You know, what have they tried? Or, or is the dog responding to medication? Is it not? Is it one leg and then the other? I think these are all important questions um, to start asking when you're trying to, you know, investigate these sometimes mystery orthopedic cases. So the first thing we typically do is get analysis when they're walking if we take a history. And so I'm just gonna briefly show um, two quick videos. So this first video is a slow video of uh, forelimb lameness. And this is the more classic one. This is maybe a little bit easier for most people to see. Um, and we always say down on sound. So this dog's head will come down when the left forelimb goes down. And then the head will rise up when the right limb strikes the ground. And this is the most common way we'll see forelimb lamenesses. Um, so again, in this video, the right limb. In this second video, this is limb lameness. And so in this video, you can see that the dog is definitely bearing more weight towards the right side. Um, when the dog steps on the left limb, the, the hind end kind of steps up and even the tail goes up in the air. And all that is basically trying to limit as much force as possible that the dog is putting on that left hind limb. All right, and then sometimes we get patients that look like this. I could play that one more time for you. And so when you see puppies like this, that's time to talk to your neurologist and ask them what they think. Um, so definitely we, just as frequently as we see young dogs with orthopedic disease, we can see them with neurologic disease as well. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to end, end up imaging that dog. So we're not quite sure what was going on, but we were highly suspicious of something orthopedic. All right, so in addition to, you know, your gait analysis and, you know, while they're kind of walking or trotting, the other thing you wanna notice is how do they get up? How do they sit? How do they stand? You know, often dogs, when they're just standing there, if a limb hurts, they'll actually elevate it slightly more off the ground. And so you can see a little bit more paw pad um, with the limb that they're favoring. If you look, notice scuffing, dragging, oh, audio not coming through. Um, If, it, uh, if there's another problem with audio, let me know. I can try to get the headphones in again. Um, so looking at um, the nails to see if they're scuffed or worn down in, in one foot versus the other. Um, and their muscling is a big one. You know, that's the, when we talk about the ortho component of the physical exam, it's musculoskeletal. And so definitely looking at muscle asymmetry can let you know at least um, maybe which like the lameness is more chronic on, especially if it's a case of bilateral lameness. Um, and then to quickly review, you know, the basic orthopedic exam, um, the big things you're looking for in the joints, you're looking for a crepitus, any changes in range of motion, 
effusion in joints, pain instability, long bones are palpating for pain. And then there are a few specific tests that we look for in the thoracic and pelvic limbs. Um, the biggest one when we're talking about young dogs, probably in the forelimb would be the cubital test. And when you're doing the cubital test, basically what you're doing is you're putting the carpus in the elbow at 90 degrees. And then while keeping the elbow still, you're internally and externally rotating the carpus. What that's gonna do is that's gonna put, put pressure on the um, elbow and on the middle compartment of the joint. And it's a really good diagnostic test for dogs with elbow dysplasia. When we're looking at the pelvic limb in young dogs, the big one there is the um, Ortolani maneuver. And so just a little bit more info for that. So when you're doing the Ortolani maneuver, basically what you're doing is you are um, using you know, one hand to support the dog's back and then putting their stifle, and their, uh, stifle at 90 degrees and you're pushing in and adducting the limb. As you're applying dorsal pressure along the axis of the femur, you then slowly start to abduct the limb. And what you're listening and feeling for is the thud. And so just to kind of do a little visual of that, um, basically what you want is you have your, this is your acetabulum right here. This is the head of your femur. And you're um, adducting, you are pushing in really hard. And then as you abduct, you're, you're, so sorry, as you're adducting, you're pushing it above the acetabulum, as you can see. And as you abduct, what you're feeling for is the thud of the head of the femur falling back into the acetabulum. Um, this is definitely much easier under sedation. And so something you can do when you're doing your spay or neuter. Um, the other thing is if dogs have a very, very shallow acetabulum, then you won't, you won't feel anything because there's no thud for the head of the femur to fall back in place. Um, as far as diagnostic options, um, you know, a variety of stuff that you'll have available in your practice, and then some of it like advanced imaging, because you're looking to go to a, a specialty hospital there. Blood work, you're most likely either looking at 40X um, you know, through a Lyme disease, or if you're running full blood work, you're worried about something more systemic. As far as cytology goes, in young dogs, you're mostly looking at, um, is it early signs of arthritis, or is it infective or aseptic arthritis? And so the big thing there is to know that in a um, osteoarthritic joint, you're going to have a really high percentage of, of mononuclear cells, whereas in a septic joint, you're going to have mostly neutrophils. If you're lucky, you'll see bacteria within neutrophils. Um, and even, you know, there's a recent study where they cultured a bunch of septic joints, and only about 50% of them actually grew something uh, as a positive culture. And so sometimes, um, well, and honestly, quite frequently, we end up putting dogs on lower, long courses of antibiotics without a real definitive diagnosis of septic arthritis. Um, just because of the lack of ability to kind of get those positive diagnostics. So as far as radiographs go, I uh, went and talked to our radiologists and I asked them, you know, if we're looking to get the best chance of a, a strong diagnosis when we're submitting radiographs, what are the things that you look for? Um, and these are kind of a list of the things that they gave me. And a lot of these apply specifically to, you know, young juvenile dogs as well. So um, definitely if, We've all, I think, taken those radiographs where the dog's flailing on the table and it's hard to get a good view and we end up taking, you know, missing half the leg or taking half the dog in the, the image. Um, so sometimes I think biting the bullet and just sedating the dog and, or setting them up for another appointment to come in for sedation um, is often the best way to get, you know, those good images. Um, we always wanna be taking orthogonal views, especially with orthopedic disease. Um, it's very easy to miss fractures if we're not taking, you know, laterals and cranial caudals. Um, always wanna correctly label our images. Comparison views are very, very helpful for young dogs, um, especially with all those growth plates. We're not always accustomed to looking at, um, you know, the carpus of a young dog with, you know, 10 different growth plates in there. And so being able to compare one side to the other is, is beneficial in trying to determine if there's something wrong. Um, flexion and extension, um, you know, for, especially for certain, you know, injuries, whether if we're looking for, you know, an ununited ankynel process in a dog, we might want to flex elbow or if we're not sure if a tubular tuberosity is evolved, again, we want a flex view there. Um, technique and collimating are also very important, you know, especially if you're, we're looking at a very precise area like a digit or a hock, collimating the view to that specific area is gonna give a lot more definition to the radiologist and, you know, make their job a lot easier and be able to give you, you know, a, a better interpretation of the images that you send them. So this is a really great case of a, a dog with a tibial tuberosity evolution. And so you can kind of see, you know, working from the left of your screen to the right. On the left side, if you took that image, you could say, okay, there's probably some widening of the tibial tuberosity there. I, you know, I think there's a little bone fragment there. I'm, I'm suspicious that there's something going on. 
Then the next video you take on the right side and you can say, okay, there's definitely, there's definitely a difference there. Um, now you're more worried about the left. But if you just take that flexed view, it becomes very, very obvious that there's an injury there. Then we move on to some more advanced imaging. Um, so when we're doing CT scans, we're typically imaging elbows, the tarsus, carpus, um, skull is all very helpful. Really joints that have a more three-dimensional component um, that are a lot easier to visualize. We also will sometimes do MRI. Um, we honestly mostly will do this just for neurologic system, but there's a lot of use as far as looking at muscles, tendons, um, and there's been several studies looking at stifle disease, diagnosing meniscal tears and things like that. Um, obviously that's incredibly common on the human side, uh, but much more uncommon on our side, um, unless we feel like we need to go there. And then again, the last one would be ultrasound. Um, again, mostly tendons, muscles, ligaments, uh, there has been a few studies looking at stifles and trying to diagnose meniscal tears uh, with ultrasound, which was you know, not very successful, but again, just another option that we have. All right, so then to talk a little bit about medical management, and this will just basically apply to the majority of not even just young dog, but old dog orthopedic cases as well, where maybe you're you know, trying to, to treat them more conservatively before referring or performing a, a major surgery for them. Um, weight loss, definitely the big one, the easiest one, the cheapest one. There's been numerous studies that have kind of looked at this. And, you know, we know that dogs that are leaner live longer, are more comfortable. And this is partly, you know, less weight, less force in their joints, but this is also a decrease in inflammatory factors and things like that. Um, as far as goals, you you might see a variety of suggestions for weight loss. Um, but certainly the, the typical goal would be to reduce body weight by one to 2% per week. Um, and a lot of, you know, on the more aggressive side, you can aim for about 60 to 70% of RER as their target calories per day when you start to get them to lose weight. And I think having owners perform routine check-ins in your office to see, to track the weight loss can make a huge difference. And, you know, anytime we see an orthopedic patient, even if we're performing surgery, this is the talk we're almost always having um, because I'm sure just like, you know, I see, I'm sure you see a lot of eight month old Labradors coming in that are way overweight and, you know, getting them to lose 15 or 20 pounds can save them from that FHO or that total hip or something like that. Um, activity modification, another easy one. And, you know, again, this applies to a little bit differently from young dogs to old dogs with arthritis. In young dogs, if you're, you know, trying to modify their activity for due to some sort of trauma, you're probably gonna rest them pretty strictly in the beginning. But then, you know, as they are kind of coming out of it, it's just titrating their activity level to what's most appropriate for them. Um, you know, you wanna kind of avoid this, the dog that is static at home all day, and then on the weekends goes and does the four mile hike up the mountains, because of course they're gonna be lame after that. As far as um, medications go, there are definitely a whole host of these that are available. Um, I think there's been a lot more focus recently on scientific evidence of a lot of these medications and, you know, what is really effective for these dogs. So definitely the, you know, NSAIDs are definitely the mainstay. That's the one that we all jump to and certainly the one with the most research behind it the most and the most efficacy. Um, and I think, you know, everybody kind of has their favorites that they, they go to and I think they're all fine and they've, they've all have a decent amount of research behind them that shows how effective they are. Um, I think, you know, the, they originally, they have these COX-2 selective ones, which are the more common ones, maybe the carprofen, loxicam, and OnStar, which we've been using a lot for cats recently. Um, and then we also have these more COX-2 specific ones. And originally the idea was that the more COX-2 specific would be, it would have less side effects, but we've kind of found that in general, they seem to have the same amount of side effects as um, the, the more selective ones. Just a, a quick word about um, Galopran. This is definitely gaining a lot more popularity since this came out a few years ago. Um, and the idea was that this targets the inflammatory um, receptor a little bit further down the train. And the goal was to prevent, you know, hopefully target this and limit a lot of the side effects that we see with NSAIDs, um, such as vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and then, you know, sometimes with Rotomandel, we can see a liver, kidney injury. And I think the only thing that I point out is, you know, in the studies that they did on these dogs, they, you know, the big ones, one they did it in healthy dogs, one they did in arthritic dogs, and they found that they were effective, but they were still seeing vomiting in about 17% of these dogs. And so 
as much as I would love to find an NSAID with, um, you know, no side effects, there, there's, you still will see them with this. Um, but certainly, you know, maybe a safer option for certain dogs. So then we move to opioids, um, maybe more of a controversial topic now. Um, and so I can just kind of briefly go through some of the evidence for some of these. So codeine is something that some places will carry. And the important thing about codeine is that it breaks down to active metabolites, morphine, and then this codeine 6 uh, glucuronide. And so these uh, metabolites have certainly been shown to be effective in at least people. Um, and the, the one study that I'll point to kind of at the bottom of the slide, the codeine was effective, but this was an injectable subcutaneous dose that they did. Um, the concern is that when you are giving this orally, a lot of this isn't actually absorbed and there's not really bioavailable. So in this one study, they showed that the morphine component was actually quite low in its bioavailability, but the other component that is supposed to be active was a little bit more available. And so this, you know, there is some evidence there to say that codeine can be beneficial for our patients as far as pain control goes. Um, tramadol, certainly very controversial. I think this has gone from the, one of the most used pain medications to now maybe one of the more least used ones. I would say the majority of patients that I'm seeing referred in are usually on a gabapentin and an NSAID. Um, you know, there's mixed evidence for the efficacy of tramadol. Um, the one study done by Martins and AGVR was injectable tramadol, which seemed to work, but obviously the majority of us are using oral. Um, the one paper that really stands out to me is the Budsberg paper in 2018, where they basically had placebo and tramadol, and they put dogs on a 10-day course of this medication. And this was dogs with arthritis in the elbow and the stifle, um, and there was really no difference between tramadol and placebo. So not to say that it doesn't work for all dogs, but I think, you know, this, this is certainly not one where there's a ton of evidence to say that we're making a big difference with it. Um, amantadine is another option that we'll often use. There's honestly really only one good article for amantadine um, where they use it in combination with an NSAID and found that there was some benefit there. The one thing about this was that the, they didn't see benefit for several weeks after they started the amantadine dose. And so, you know, if you're looking for an immediate effect, it's, I would say there's not a ton of evidence to say that it's going to start working right away. And then these GABA analogs have definitely taken over, um, a lot of the, you know, as one of our primary go-tos. Um, the majority of us will use gabapentin, but now that um, pregabalin or Lyrica has, is no longer um, like just Lyrica available, we have, you know, uh, other versions of it available now, it might become more and more common. Um, we personally just did get this at Nordstar, and so we might be seeing it used more and more. Um, the exact mechanism of these medications is unknown, but it's actually not that it's a GABA analog. It actually um, decreases calcium influx and probably and uh, likely prevents release of neurotransmitters uh, related to pain. As far as gabapentin goes, again, we're looking at more mixed evidence here as far as how effective it is or it isn't. You know, some studies show it has MAC faring effects. Um, there were some preoperative dosing that seemed to reduce pain, but then there were studies with limb amputations um, and dogs that had disc surgery and there wasn't really a consistent uh, effect of gabapentin in those treatments or in those papers. Pregabalin, there's a few new papers out there. It does seem to be effective for neuro dogs with neuropathic pain, um, whether that's IVDD or cerebral myelia. Um, and then just in general, we do know that the oral dosing does seem to produce appropriate oral concentrations. So I would just keep an eye out for more studies looking at um, pregabalin and its efficacy in dogs and cats as well. And then there are a whole host of disease modifying agents that I'm sure we use pretty routinely. Um, Adequan is a pretty popular one. I think the big thing with this one is that while we would love for it, we would love to give Adequan or glucosamine to those other supplements to, you know, rebuild cartilage and things like that. They really more likely seem to have a protective effect. And so if you can get them started early in the disease process, then they seem to delay the onset of arthritis and the degeneration of cartilage. Um, again, glucosamine, uh, definitely something that owners are always asking about, common for people to take and animals. Um, and the big thing with this is similarly, you know, evidence is mixed. Um, the two big papers that I think about, one showed it was beneficial, one showed it did it, it wasn't beneficial. 
Um, but the thing with these papers is one was looking at subjective outcomes, wasn't was looking at just activity counts. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of variability in there and how effective these things are. And so, I'm, you know, I'm sure everybody has different opinions about it. And I'd be happy to, you know, kind of hear your experiences with them. Um, usually what I tell owners is it might work. It definitely doesn't hurt. And so I think it's worth trying. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about the most common orthopedic trauma, um, especially as it pertains to younger patients. So I think whenever we're seeing any trauma patient, uh, the one thing I always like to point out is that really broken bones kind of take a backseat to everything else going on. And so you always wanna you know, stick with your ABCs, um, get the patient's pain or control, evaluate neurologic status, thoracic and abdominal trauma, um, and then you can start to investigate and worry about treating any sort of broken bones. So as far as basic classification goes, this is, um, I'm sure, much stuff that you know already. Um, but basically, you know, if you're calling to kind of describe a fracture to a surgeon and talk about options and you maybe don't have the radiographs readily available, these are the big things that we want to talk about and know. Um, the little chart on the bottom left, most of us don't use it. That's kind of more like an AO classification um, where basically you're using numbers to kind of delineate things. So just something that's out there, but not something that's used, you know, very commonly. More pertaining to younger dogs, uh, we think about Salter Harris fractures um, and how they, you know, you know, relate to growth plate fractures and joints in dogs. And so, I think everybody might have a different acronym for how they remember these. But I use the Salter method, um, where one is slip, um, two is above the physis, three below or through the epiphysis, um, four is through the whole thing, and then five is a ram or a crush injury. Um, the tricky thing about those is that those aren't always noticeable on radiographs until somewhere down the line. And I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, the other thing is the book will sometimes say something about a type six, which is a crush injury of just one side. And this can lead to angular limb deformities and you know, other signs down the line as well. Um, and then we talk about different classifications of open fractures. And basically you're going from small laceration to large laceration from type one to three. And then in type three, they separate it into three different types, A, B, and C. And when you kind of move down that chart um, heading towards C, you're looking at, you know, more extensive trauma, more exposed bone. And then in the case of C, you're looking at um, severe arterial supply damage. Uh, this was something that was developed, you know, in humans first and kind of translated to dogs. And it certainly, you know, makes a little bit of difference in how we treat things, but also makes a huge difference in the prognosis that we can give owners. Um, there is another classification scheme that was developed, and again, this is used more on the human side, but they break it apart a little bit more into contamination, skin, muscle, bone, um, arterial supply, and then all these different degrees of that. This is not something that's really gained a lot of traction um, in veterinary medicine yet, but it might be something that we see in the future. And so I think the big thing with this is, you know, why does it matter? Um, and this really goes for any kind of patient, young or old. Um, the, the worst, the open fracture, basically the higher chance of infection, the higher chance of complication, and the more expensive it ends up being for the patient. And so these are just all different types of open fractures um, that we can sometimes see. And obviously treatment for the fracture in the top left or the far right is gonna be different from that fracture that we see in the center. Um, and you might be surprised to know that all these dogs did end up keeping their legs, but obviously the cost and the treatment and the the time that was spent working on these dogs and the, the dedication required from these owners um, was quite different for each different one. So if we're dealing with open fractures, um, after we've done our initial stabilization, we obviously wanna get them started on antibiotics right away, um, manage the wound, clip the ride, lavage. Um, there's you know this thing out there that we wanna use seven to eight PSI. I don't know anybody who has their pressure gauge out and is measuring how much saline they're pumping into the, the wound. I think the big thing is, you know, getting it flushed as best as possible, whether that's with tap water, if it's a very, very contaminated wound or saline if you have it available. Um, and then, you know, bandaging or casting that wound and getting it covered. And so, you know, then we often talk about external coaptation and, you know, what we need to be putting on these dogs. I think the basic rules are, you, you know, if you have a long bone fracture, you always wanna go and build the bandage or the splint or the cast a joint above and below the fracture. And so I really, this kind of limits us to fractures below the elbow or below the stifle. Um, now we do have spica splints that we could put 
you know, on a, a humeral fracture. And definitely those, those can be done. We'll do them infrequently. Um, they mostly end up being a pain for the dogs. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen a dog try to hobble around um, in a spike of splint, but it's always a nightmare for the owners. It's a pain for the dogs. And so I think if the dog is being kind of referred and sent over for, you know, fixation of a humeral fracture, especially those puppies that get the condylar fractures, you certainly can put a spike of splint on, but if you just want to hit them with pain meds and sedation and send them over, we usually just keep them quiet um, in the cage, you know, and on good, good pain control. And they, they tend to do just fine. Um, but, you know, I think this is also something where you might get a different opinion from a different surgeon you talk to. And I think that's okay. Um, and then after that, obviously moving on to definitive treatment, and that'll just vary to, based on the fracture type and, um, you know, the owners and what needs to be done for that particular patient. And then something that might be asking for you is, you know, what, can we, what if a patient can't afford thousands of dollars worth of surgery and they want to just cast or splint? Um, and so when you look at the ideal candidate for casting, really you want a young dog. Ideally, you have a fracture that's below the stifle or the elbow. So you're looking for radius ulna or tibia or something, you know, in the metacarpals or digits. Um, and ideally not an articular. Certainly if you have an articular fracture, you want to try to oppose that as best as possible to limit the progression of arthritis as that pet ages. When you're reducing these fractures, you want to shoot for at least 50-50 apposition, 50% 50 apposition of the bones. And the important thing here is you want to take two views here after you get them casted, where you have 50% coverage, medial lateral and cranial caudal. And then another thing to consider is, you know, the size of the dog. The little chihuahua that comes in with the radial fracture, those are have an extremely high complication um, and frequency of non-healing when we try to splint them. Um, and we, you know, I think sometimes people are just limited to that being their only option, but it is the, probably the most common non-union scenario we see is that tiny dog with the radius fracture that's been splinted for 10 weeks and is not making any progress. Um, but the, you know, maybe the, the eight month old um, pit bull that comes in that we can keep calm and get in a cast with a simple transverse fracture, those guys tend to do pretty well and heal fairly quickly. I think, you know, when you're pairing these patients and clients, um, and this is maybe something a little bit more specific to North Star as far as prices, obviously this varies a lot depending on where you are, but at least this might give you a, a rough idea of, you know, when you're educating owners kind of what you can, what you can help them plan for. Um, and, you know, obviously simple fractures with pins, you're looking at a much lower end than a dog with horrible polytrauma who's going to spend days in the ICU or a patient who's going to need an external fixator on and need to come in for bandage changes once a week for the next three months have multiple surgeries, have pins taken out a few at a time. Um, and so, you know, obviously not a, a conversation that you always have to have with an owner. Um, this is something that we always talk with them beforehand before pursuing more definitive treatment, but always important things to, you know, kind of consider. And then, you know, when I'm talking to um, owners, when we have these tumor condor fractures or other growth plate fractures or just any general young dog, um, the one good benefit that they have is that healing usually will take place a lot quicker than our, you know, older dogs that have fractures or tea pillows or things like that. Um, and so usually we're looking at four to six weeks for healing. If they're very young, sometimes it could even be three to four weeks. I always try to let them know that injuries to their growth plate, those can lead to limb deformities um, and they can lead to their OA progression in the future. Um, implants, especially pins, they can migrate, break, um, they can become infected and it's um, not uncommon for us to have to go and remove those, especially if they're bothering a patient at a later time or if they migrate. Um, I certainly heard stories where, you know, the patient's been home for four weeks doing well, and then the owner all of a sudden notices there's a big piece of metal sticking out of their dog. Usually it's fine, they don't have to panic, they come in, we pull the pin out, um, but certainly it can be a little disconcerting to owners when they see that. Um, obviously activity restriction, the hardest thing to get owners to be compliant with, um, but quite important. And then wearing that cone the first two weeks. The last thing we want to do is, um, have this big repair, put these implants in there, and then have the dog lip, lick open the incision, get it infected, and then kind of delay healing that much longer. Um, so this is just one example. This is a dog with a humeral condor fracture, um, which we, you know, will often repair with a screw and a pin. Um, and again, with this owner, you know, I would tell them, um, you know, things to look out for. You might have OA. Um, that pin could migrate and have to come out at a certain point in time. 
But usually in young dogs, if you get this to stay, you know, get the dogs to stay calm for four to six weeks, usually this will be healed in no time and they'll be, um, you know, kind of good to get back to their normal activity. This is another example of a dog with a tibial tuberosity bulging. I think this is a different one than from the one earlier in the study. But again, placing pins, cheap implants, um, this will be on the lower end of those estimates. And usually we can keep them calm for a long enough period of time. They heal quite well. All right. Um, so now I will uh, just start going over more of the orthopedic diseases that we like to talk about. Um, I don't know if anybody has a quick question they want to ask about the first half of anything. If you do, just fill the type it in and I can go ahead and answer it. All right, so I'll start talking about elbow dysplasia. Um, so elbow dysplasia is a generic term that we use to kind of talk about a disease that has multiple components to it. Um, so one would be a fragmented medial coronary process, one would be OCD of the humeral trochlea, and then sometimes we can see that with a component of ununited and canal process, joint incongruity, and then the coronary sclerosis, basically those kind of things have been encompassed into something called medial compartment disease, which is basically any combination of these other than that UAP. Um, and that's, you know, 90% of dogs that we see with elbow dysplasia, that's what we're worried about is that medial compartment there. There is a lot of debate about the, the pathogenesis and cause of elbow dysplasia in dogs. And there's been a lot of time and research and money put into figuring out what's going on. Um, there is range from incongruence, whether that's radial ulnar or humeral trochlear or, you know, any combination of the above. Um, and it's been hard to find kind of consistent studies uh, the one more recent study that came out was looking at um, very, very young dogs and their development of fragmented meal coronary processes. And there does seem to be at least some component of OCD in that region um, that leads to these fragments that develop. So you, often the first diagnostic will uh, end up doing is radiographs of this area. And I think the, the tricky thing with elbows is that radiographs are, make it a little more difficult to kind of see the whole picture there. Um, I know our radiologists are well-trained and they certainly can see a lot more than I can see when I'm looking at them. And I think that just has to do with the overlapping, you know, three dimensions of the bone um, and trying to get a better view of that, you know, medial coronoid through the radius um, or, you know, the ankle process if we don't have a good flex view there. Um, this is a great image from Lost Audio. Any better now? Okay. Thank you. So this is a great image from the textbook um, where basically they're kind of pointing out all the you know locations to look for as far as disease goes in the elbow in these young dogs. Um, and really, you know, looking at you want to look, kind of look at the whole elbow, everything from the ankylal process to the medial coronoid to that lateral epicondylar ridge. Um, the cranial caudal view, that little H, is really good for looking for OCD lesions. And so, you know, this is a, a really great normal image to then kind of compare to a dog with the diseased elbows. When we end up seeing them for referral, we'll often perform some form of advanced imaging. Um, most, most commonly, we'll do a CT scan. And really, we'll do that to kind of get a better idea of, you know, what's going on in the joint and really look for those fragments. Um, there are other things, you know, MRI certainly can be done and has a high degree of accuracy, but is much more expensive, requires a lot more anesthesia, and really is not routinely um, performed. Um, ultrasound certainly wouldn't be used instead of CT, um, but, and really arthroscopy becomes the gold standard there. So as far as treatment goes, um, certainly the easiest and simple one is conservative medical management, um, and that really consists of activity restriction, um, pain management, weight loss is if indicated, and then those, um, you know, disease modifying agents that we talked about earlier. And typically what I'll tell an owner, um, honestly, whether they do arthroscopy or not, is I will say, rest your dog pretty strictly for the next four to six weeks, give NSAIDs for at least the first two weeks, and then as needed after that. And then after that time, either check in or just slowly start to wean them back to their normal level of activity. Um, and, you know, how long they truly rest their dogs, we never really know. Um, but that's like the typical spiel that I'll, I'll kind of give elbow dogs, especially young ones, when they're trying uh, a more conservative route. 
I think um, if you end up sending them to a surgeon, the most common thing that we'll end up doing is CTing and then performing arthroscopy. Um, and we'll basically be going in there to remove any fragments of, of the medial coronoid. There are a lot of other um, different types of surgery out there that, you know, if you kind of look into them, there's, you know, tens of different surgeries that people have tried and experimented with. And a very small portion of surgeons will end up performing a lot of these procedures. And a lot of it just has to do with inconsistency in results. Um, some of them, the techniques aren't really taught very commonly. And so I think because the elbow in itself is just such a, a tricky joint and outcomes aren't great as it already is, there's a lot of morbidity in these procedures um, that might doesn't always translate to better outcomes. Um, certainly the more advanced ones like total elbow replacements or Q, which is a partial elbow replacement, you have to go to very, very specific places um, to kind of get those done. Um, we already talked a lot about a lot of this. Um, the one thing to add is, you know, PRP and stem cell therapy. Again, we're definitely, there's a mixed bag of evidence as far as efficacy of those go. PRP definitely has a big hole now in human medicine. That's becoming very common for joint or um, ligament and tendon injuries. And so we'll probably see that become more and more common. Um, PRP is something that we do quite routinely at um, North Star, especially for elbows. When talking to owners about doing conservative versus surgical management, I think there's also a lot of controversy here. Um, and I would say surgeons probably feel differently. And I think the, I would I imagine that all of your experiences are different as well. One big study that sticks out is this Burton study that was performed where they found that there was no difference in dogs with medical versus arthroscopy um, at 26 and 52 weeks based on gait evaluation. And, you know, that wasn't a randomized study. There were, I'm sure, a lot of variables that kind of went into that. But I think there's something to be said there. You know, it's not like we can say, oh, we're going to do arthroscopy. We're going to remove that fragment. And your dog's going to be great. There'll never be a problem. It'll never have a lameness again. You know, that's unfortunately for elbows, um, not the, the realistic outcome that we often see. Personally, I think that if we can get to them at a younger age and remove those fragments, we're probably serving them, we're probably benefiting them at a decent amount where, you know, that kind of pebble in the shoe effect is gone and hopefully limiting the progression of arthritis. I think regardless, they're going to get arthritis in the future. Um, it's kind of just the hope of limiting that. But if they can't afford $7,000 of imaging and an arthroscopy, then it might, you know, they're, it's not like they're doomed with conservative management. I think that it can certainly have a lot of benefits. We'll sometimes also see older dogs come in for these, or we'll see dogs what we call jump down injuries, where they probably are previously disposed with elbow dysplasia and arthritis there, and then they'll have a more traumatic fragmentation of that medial coronoid. Those dogs also probably do benefit from fragmentation removal, but again, there's not a ton of evidence out there to, to say that for sure. And I think in general, just most surgeons are probably pretty frustrated by elbow disease because there are all these surgeries we all want to find the one that's going to treat it and kind of get the dogs back to normal, but we haven't quite found it yet. And then the other possible component we talked about with um, elbow dysplasia is a united end canal process. And that's typically defined by failure of fusion of um, the end canal process by about 20 weeks. This definitely varies a lot uh, depending on the dog. And so greyhounds tend to fuse earlier around 16. Shepherds, we typically stick with the, the 20 week mark. The original thought was that this was, you know, a growth plate that didn't fuse. There have actually been a few studies where they've shown that the, the place where this fissure develops is actually separate from that secondary uh, center of ossification. And so the pathogenesis is not very clear. Certainly the best way to diagnose this is with that flexed view on radiographs. Sometimes we'll catch it on CT too if we're, you know, we're imaging for medial compartment disease as well. Um, there is some theory that if you have a long radius, then you're going to put increased pressure on that end canal process, and that can lead to fragmentation as well. And there's also some thought that, you know, as these dogs grow, their own and the radius don't necessarily grow at an equal plane, but they might kind of grow in a stepwise fashion. So maybe we're, there's transient pressure there that we're missing. As far as treatment goes, variety of options there, whether it's reattachment, removal, sometimes you're doing um, an osteotomy of the ulna to release tension on that. And so while these dogs could be managed medically, certainly surgery would 
probably the better option for these guys, even if it is just removal. I think the leaving the, the pain there can be very beneficial for these dogs. We have talked a little bit again more or previously about prognosis for elbow dysplasia. Um, in the end, we can see benefits with both conservative and surgical management, but I think OA is going to progress, and I think that's an important part of the education for owners. All right. Talk a little bit more, uh, or talk a little bit now about hip dysplasia. And so as far as, you know, etiology and kind of what causes hip dysplasia, again, as with most things in veterinary orthopedics, controversial, not quite sure. Um, the, the components that seem to be pretty consistent, though, are that these dogs have joint laxity, there's an increased amount of joint fluid that's there, they have decreased muscle mass, and then there's a lot of talk about hormonal factors. We certainly know that dogs that are obese are more likely to develop and become clinical from their hip dysplasia. Um, there might be some component of nu nutrition, and then, of course, the environment they, they live in. So as far as the anatomy of the joint, the basic breakdown of this, the stabilization of this joint into primary and secondary stabilizers. And the primary ones are the ligament at the head of the femur, the joint capsule, and the dorsal acetabular rim. And then the secondary ones are the labrum, um, the muscle that surrounds it, and then the general hydrostatic pressure that's created from that joint fluid. And if you're losing, you know, one or two of those primary stabilizers, you're likely to get instability in the joint, and that's going to lead to hip dysplasia, development arthritis, and loss of function for the dog. Typically, how we see these um, is more in a bimodal age distribution. Um, so we can see them early when the joint is very lax, but maybe OA hasn't fully developed yet. These are often the dogs that we'll see with those bunny hopping gates. Um, where the, you know, they'll probably be running around like puppies and not really care, but the owners might notice the strange gait sometimes. Then usually as they age a little bit, um, joint capsule thickens, maybe they haven't lost a lot of their muscle mass and they'll clinically look normal again. And then after that, they'll start to develop the, um, more pain and discomfort and loss of function as OA develops. And as we, you know, we talked about before, um, when for young dogs, especially that Ortolani maneuver is how we're going to potentially diagnose this um, just based on physical exam in these young patients that we're seeing. This is a dog with obviously horrible hip dysplasia, and this basically just shows the different components that we can see on radiographs, which are the most common way we're going to end up diagnose, diagnosing these imaging wise. And so what we can see in this dog is that its right hip is actually subluxated. It has uh, flattened femoral heads. The acetabulum is very, very shallow. The um, necks have a lot of enthesiophytes on them, and there's a lot of muscle wasting in, in this dog as well. I think one important thing to note about radiographs, especially if we're taking them in our younger dogs, is that function is not always correlated with uh, the imaging on these, or what we're seeing on the radiographs. Uh, there was one study back in 2005, which looked at, they did peroral arthroscopy on these young dogs after taking these radiographs. And they found that even in dogs where radiographs were normal, they were still seeing arthroscopic lesions and evidence of early hip dysplasia in them. And so I think uh, the, you know, one of the orthopedic adages that we often say is, you know, treat the dog, not the radiographs. As far as um, techniques and types of radiographs that we can take in our young dogs to help diagnose hip dysplasia, the most common one that we'll often perform are the OFA radiographs or the basic extended VD view. This is great for finding OA, um, moderate subluxation, but I think we found over time that it's not great for predicting um, dysplasia in these mi more mildly affected dogs. When you're looking at this view, obviously you want to try to see more than 50% coverage of the femoral head. You can do things like measure the Norbrook angle, where you're basically measuring um, how far out the hip is displaced from the acetabulum. Um, but the important thing to know with these is that the positioning that you put these dogs in where you're internally rotating the stifles can eliminate the subluxation of the hips and make hips that are maybe not, you know, mild to moderately affected look like they're good hips. Um, and unfortunately, this is how a lot of breeders are making their breeding decisions for their dogs based on these types of radiographs, which are not always the most accurate. But off, off, honestly, they can, they're better than nothing, I think, um, as far as you know, picking up breeders go. Because of that, there have been other more advanced techniques that have been developed to you know, look for 
more subtle um, subluxation and basically used to predict dogs that are going to go on to develop hip dysplasia in the future. The most common one that we'll, t we'll typically talk about is the pen hip, um, which is looking for a laxity in the hip. And they'll typically do dogs between eight to 12 months and they calculate something called distraction index, which is basically you know, how far out they can pull the femoral head from the acetabulum. In order to do this, you do have to send these to special radiologists who are certified to read these imaging. Um, you have to be especially trained to take these radiographs. And you know, if you can get a, a dog who, or a, an owner who's breeding dogs to kind of get these radiographs done, then they're definitely gonna come away with the, a better breeding stock than just doing OFA dogs or OFA radiographs. Um, the DLS is a, a similar method that can often be used and it's a, basically a similar technique. Um, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's as widely used as the pen hip is. So as far as surgical intervention for dogs with hip dysplasia, there are certain surgeries that we can do very early on, such as um, juvenile pubic symphysiodesis or a DPO or a TPO, so a double or triple pelvic osteotomy. And these are the dogs that we can treat at a younger age and hopefully intervene before the severe arthritis develops. If we're treating them at a later age, then we're talking about more salvage procedures like a total hip replacement or a femoral head and neck ostectomy or FHO. So as far as the JPS goes, what we're doing here is we're basically fusing the cranial portion of the pubic um, symphysis. And what that's doing is as the dog continues to grow, it'll create ventral version of the acetabulum, improving the coverage of the femoral heads with the acetabulum. When you're looking at these cases, you're really looking at dogs between, between 12 to 20 weeks of age. And so you can imagine that finding these cases or finding these, you know, these dogs that can kind of fit this criteria can be a little difficult because we're not often, you know, seeing severe lameness or diagnosing orthopedic disease in these guys. And this might be one of those cases where if you're doing your spay or your neuter at a younger age and doing your ortolani and finding that it's positive, you know, this then might be an intervention that you can do early on. Um, there, you know, one thing that used to be said about this was, you know, do we neuter and spay at the same time we do this? And the, the concern there is that if you have a dog that somebody wants to breed, if you perform a JPS, it makes them seem like they have good femoral head coverage when they get older, but then really they were genetically predisposed to poor hips. That's not something that you necessarily want to want to pass down for generations. In order to perform this procedure, what you end up doing is making a ventral midline incision over about the um, cranial two centimeters of the abdomen and then over the pubis. You want to elevate the adductor and gracilis muscles. Um, and then using cautery, um, whether that's uh, you know like a, a more like a paddle shape or just a fine straight cautery pen, um, you want to kind of go across the first one third to one half of the symphysis, so the, the cranial one third or one half of that, um, kind of with these specifications. And that'll basically shut down that growth plate and um, help create that ventral version of the hip or of the acetabulum covering the hips. And that'll develop, that'll happen over the course of a few weeks to months. Uh, there, again, been you know, several studies looking at this. And I think the important thing to know is that there's really been no proven benefit of performing this surgery on dogs after 22 weeks. And so really, again, we have to find these dogs at the youngest age possible. Um, then talking about a, a triple or double pelvic osteotomy, this is probably something that you're going to have to refer for, um, and not every surgeon does perform this procedure. Um, but basically, this is after they've grown a little bit more, and you need to create that increased coverage of the femoral head, but you're going to do it by um, cutting bone and putting a plate on to realign the hip joint. Again, when we're talking about case selection for this dog, if you're looking for the right dog to get this surgery, you're ideally looking for one 10 months or younger you're looking for a dog that's obviously clinically affected and lame from its hip dysplasia, um, that has joint laxity, and then ideally you want one that hasn't already developed signs of arthritis. Um, other important thing is in something that the surgeon will assess is, you know, there has to be some femoral head coverage to kind of go over, you, you know, to bring the acetabulum over the femoral head. If you don't have that, then there's no, you know, if you just have a flat acetabulum, it doesn't matter how much you rotate it, there's nothing to keep the femoral head in place. And so this is, um, this is, oh, sorry, I'm just looking to see if there's issues. Okay. 
Looks like everybody can still hear me. Again, just message it if you can. Um, so even with this procedure, OA will occur in the future. Um, we certainly have some dogs that will have these procedures and then later on still develop arthritis and have total hip replacements. Um, I think the, the big thing with this procedure to know is that there are a lot of potential complications and there are serious complications. Um, some of them relate to the implants as far as infection or implant failure, screws backing out, um, but other things like static nerve in injury, um, issues with urination, defecation, um, and then you know, lameness to the femoral neck impingement are all possible. I think um, we don't see these luckily very commonly, but they are, they are out there. And compared to the JPS procedure, those, you know, that surgery has a lot less potential complications than this one does. And so if we can get to them earlier, certainly better for the dog. Um, and as you can see in this procedure, what you're basically doing is you're cutting the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, and you're putting this plate on that's tilting the acetabulum over the femoral head. Then we get to talk about um, salvage procedures and you know who's a candidate for an FHO and who's a candidate for a total hip. And you know, really any candidate is a pa or any patient's a candidate for an FHO that has bad hip dysplasia and is affected. The big thing is, you know, a lot of dogs with hip dysplasia and discomfort, most of them don't really need surgery. They can be managed medically with all the things that we've talked about prior. Um, it's just a matter of the owners kind of putting the commitment and the time for the rehab and the weight loss and managing the pain. Um, but if they, you know, if, if they've tried that for a while and they aren't succeeding, then we do have these salvage procedures. Obviously in our bigger dogs, we love to be able to perform total hip replacements. They definitely have superior function and outcome. But obviously the chances of complications are much higher that, you know, there's always the potential for needing to convert to an FHO after a total hip or need to um, revise the, the total hip if there are complications. And so for the owners who are okay taking some risk for a superior outcome, I think total hips are great to recommend and refer for. But if people are, are concerned, can only do a one and done, or if they have a smaller dog, then I think FHO is, you know, an absolutely fine procedure for them. Uh, another disease that we'll see pretty commonly in young dogs and their hips, um, and this is mostly your young dogs, like your, your Yorkies and your Chihuahuas is uh, like Caparthia's disease or a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. And this is basically due to local ischemia, um, necrosis, fragmentation, and reossification of that femoral neck. We'll most commonly see it in young dogs for 11 months of age. And in a certain subset, we can see this bilaterally. The most common way we'll see this radiographically is this apple core appearance that we can see of the femoral neck. They, there's one study looking at conservative management for these dogs and they felt like 25%, less than 25% of them improved over time. And so most often we end up recommending these dogs have FHOs. Um, there was one study that looked at total hip replacements in these dogs, and these these dogs, usually these dogs this size, need um, a micro total hip, not the, the normal total hip, and those do have a slightly higher complication rate than the normal total hip that, that we would perform. Moving away from hips now, um, going to other um, orthopedic diseases of young dogs. Canosteitis is certainly a fairly common one that we'll see, which is an inflammatory disease of long bones. We'll see this commonly um, between five and 12 months of age, but we can see it in older dogs up to five years that have been reported. Uh, most commonly we'll see this in large and giant breed dogs, especially German Shepherds. That's the one that I think about most commonly. Yeah, we certainly see this more commonly in the thoracic limb versus the pelvic limbs, but really we can see this in, in any long bone. Um, just a, a case earlier this week, we had a dog with canosteitis in its femur. The typical presentation for these might be a shifting leg lameness where the owner will say, you know, I thought it was the left, you know, forelimb three weeks ago, but now it looks more like the right. And maybe it was the back too. I don't really know. You often, when you're doing a physical exam, palpation on long bones will make them quite painful. And for them, the best treatment is really just rest and pain medication. I think the important thing to warn owners about is that, you know, you might treat this, it might go away, and then it could always recur. Uh, it has a, kind of has a, a cyclic set of signs, and so the owner just needs to be more prepared for that. And another common disease we'll see in young growing dogs is hypertrophic osteodystrophy, or HOD. And this is, a, in several disease of lung bones, it, this is a disease of lung bones. This is one that we'll see more at the metaphyseal level. 
Um, we'll see this in dogs between two and six months of age. Again, we're looking at our lion, large and giant breed dogs. And in Weimaris in particular, there's some concern that this can be an inherited immunodeficiency. And I can get more into that a little bit in a few slides. As far as the etiology of this disease goes, there, again, there are tons and set of studies that have looked at nutrition, vitamin C levels. Is it triggered with vaccination? Um, is, there, is this infection related? Some, a few studies have shown positive culture with strong knees. Um, especially in the Weimaraners, is this heritable? And really, when they've looked at, when you compare all the studies across um, the board, nothing is really repeatable or confirmable. Um, so again, I think we we went over some of this. Um, when you're looking at radiographs, and you can see that on the, the previous slide, you're really looking for that zone of lucency right above the growth plate. Um, and then you're looking for potentially some increased opacity between the growth plate and that zone of lucency that's there. I think the slide before this also has another good image where the arrows are pointing to those regions of HOD. As far as treatment goes, it's aggressive pain medication, feeding a more balanced diet. So often we'll tell those, you know, giant breed dogs that are on normal puppy food to maybe switch to a, a large breed puppy food or switch to an adult dog food at that time. Again, we don't have definitive evidence that that's going to help, but that's a fairly common recommendation, I would say, uh, among uh, veterinary surgeons. The one thing that differentiates this disease from panosteitis is that these dogs can become quite sick and need to be hospitalized. Um, and so, you know, I, I've certainly seen unfortunately dogs who have been euthanized because they've been hospital for, for days to weeks and not been able to recover from this. Um, as far as pain medication goes, we'll often start with treatment with NSAIDs. However, especially in Weimaraners, there's definitely now a lot of evidence that steroids might be the more beneficial treatment. And I think the things with these dogs, usually if they can get through the, you know, the disease period with their pain medication and rest, they, they don't have a lot of long-term effects. But you do have to worry about them developing angular limb deformities if there is damage to the growth plate or them relapsing if they've you know, made a recovery and then kind of you know, show up signs again later on. So the one wrong around paper that people often point to is um, this case where they, instead of treating with NSAIDs, they focus on treating them with high doses, like immunosuppressive doses of prednisone. And what they found was that they were able to achieve 100% achieve remission in eight to 48 hours with this medication. Um, there were some dogs that suffered relapses. There were some dogs that had to be on medication long-term for up to a year, um, but they, they were able to you know, treat all these dogs. And so, you know, if you have your typical Labrador that comes in with HOD, I think a lot of people will still reach for NSAIDs. But if you have a wine runner, at this point, I would probably reach for steroids. But again, we're, you know, we're basing this on, on one paper here. They, in this study, the other important thing was they did have dogs that were started on NSAIDs. Um, only about half of them achieved remission. And then they had to wash those dogs out of their NSAID, start the prednisone. And then those dogs did achieve remission in the end. Uh, so another common disease, OCD, um, osteochondrosis. There's a, a few different you know, naming schemes for these. And the big ones, as you move from latents to manifesta to descans, you're basically going from early microscopic lesions, which you really can't see, the ones that you can see radiographically, to then the ones where you have true flaps or pain, or you're seeing clinical signs in those dogs. And the basis of the disease is that there's failure of endochondri um, endochondral ossification in the developing dog, leading to cartilage flaps and damage. So again, we'll see this in large giant breed dogs, um, typically between four and eight months of age, although sometimes we can see it older, usually when some arthritis has developed. As far as risk factors go, it does seem to be inherited. Um, we typically connect it to dogs with rapid growth. There's some thought that overfeeding leads to this. They've looked at calcium and vitamin D levels. You know, is there microtrauma involved? You know, especially when we talk about elbow incongruity, um, whether that's with the trochlea or the radius and ulna. And I think, again, as kind of, I've probably said this, you know, four or five times now, with a lot of these things, we, we don't know for sure. There's mixed evidence out there. There's a lot of theories, but no definitive cause. Um, just a little bit about the pathogenesis of it. Typically, the thought is that they're not quite sure why this happens, but there's some necrotic um, 
focus within the area of the joint that leads to um, fibrous tissue developing in that area. And then at that point in time, either it becomes turned into uh, bone through intramembranous, intramembranous ossification, or it leads to cartilage damage and the flaps that we typically see. The most common locations we see it are the humeral head, particularly on the, the caudal aspect, um, the medial aspect of the humeral condyle, and we often see that in conjunction with elbow dysplasia or medial compartment disease. Um, you can see it on the medial or lateral femoral condyle, and then the medial or lateral trochlear ridge of the talus. And this is a CT scan where you can kind of see there's a little flap there. As far as prevention goes, again, you'll see a whole bunch of question marks um, as far as what works best, um, potentially controlling diet and making similar changes to the ones we previously talked about. Controlling genetics, probably if you can catch this early, probably best not to recommend breeding these dogs. Um, you know, do we perform OFA elbow screening on these dogs and you know, try not to breed the ones where we're seeing evidence of OCD development? And then how do we modify, modify their, their activity? So to get a little more into that, as far as, um, you know, case selection for conservative management, which might be things that you're doing in your practice, dogs that are mildly lame or asymptomatic are probably the best case for these. Um, and especially in very young dogs where maybe they're not too severely affected, or if they're already very old and have advanced OA, um, surgical treatment might not have a huge benefit for these guys. Um, as far as what you do, NSAIDs, diet changes, so either going to that uh, you know, large breed puppy food or the adult food. And then there's kind of two different theories as far as activity for these guys. One is your standard you know, activity restriction, so trying to rest them, um, you know, decrease inflammation, get them more comfortable. And then there's an alternate theory that basically says if they have a flap there, you should exercise them, get them to loosen up that flap. And then hopefully if it breaks off, it just gets pushed into a part of the joint pouch where it's not a problem. Um, kind of hard for me to, to recommend that, but it is a theory that's out there. So I just kind of wanted to make that knowledge available to you. And um, if you wanted to read you know, more about that, I think that there's the Olson paper that kind of talks more about that information. So for dogs that aren't doing well with conservative management or can go forward with surgical treatment. There are, again, a whole host of treatment options. The most common thing that we end up doing for these flaps is going in, removing the flap, and then debriding the area. Um, when you debride that area, you hope to get down to some subchondral bone, um, create a little bit of a bleeding there, and that fills in with fibrous tissue. And depending on the location, the dogs can do well. There are other techniques to try to repair these defects. And you know, depending on where the location is, we can do these in, you know, very in large breed dogs. Um, whether that's, you know, in trying to enhance the blood flow to the area with various repair techniques and you know, where you're kind of putting holes where the flap was, or there are more restorative techniques where you're trying to reattach the fragments, which is something that you're probably that's probably more on the human side of surgery. Um, there's a procedure called an oath procedure where you harvest a segment from one section of cartilage and you put it as a plug into the defect. And there are some new synthetics that are being developed and might become more popular as time goes on. Um, and that in that image on the bottom screen, that's the synthetic cartilage that was put into an OCD lesion. As far as prognosis goes, this a little bit reminds me of elbows um, where, you know, the one good thing is dogs that have shoulder OCD, they can do quite well. Um, they will probably develop some arthritis, but overall they function you know, quite well going forward. Um, for the, you know, the other joints, we really do expect a, a way to con kind of continue to develop. Again, we hope that we're, we're delaying the discomfort, you know, we're removing that, that pebble in the shoe phenomenon where you're, you know, you have a flap that's causing the irritation, but we're certainly not, you know, curing these dogs and preventing arthritis from ever developing. Um, I think one important thing that, especially with dogs who have OCD lesions in the hop, um, they often will come in with an enormous amount of effusion and even with surgery, that effusion is usually persistent. Um, and it, but usually in the, at least the short term, so at least for the, you know, a few years, they're much more comfortable um, and not as lame. So just talk a little bit about angular limb deformity. We can see a variety of causes for this, especially in our, our young dogs. Uh, this is one case that I saw where this dog had obvious little fractures and malunion. And so you'd see this and think, oh my God, like how is this dog even walking? Um, and I have a video of this dog getting around. 
And you can see, not a, not a normal gate by any means, but this saw gets around quite well, despite, you know, those fractures. And so I think, when you see cases like this, we always have to think, you know, what is a surgical invention going to make the dog in this time? But we ended up doing one of the lights in this job, it was quickly funny, but we didn't end up doing the other one in square, big left in the corner. Oh, Chloe. <laughs> So definitely in our young dogs, the one that I think about is um, premature physal closure leading to angular limb deformity. We most commonly see this in the distal ulnar physis, and this leads to deformities in the radius and the carpus. And the reason we commonly see this is because the distal ulnar physis is kind of shaped like a cone. And so if there's that, you know, type 5 Salter Harris fracture where there's that crush injury, the growth plate can shut down, and then that leads to this lateral deviation in the, in the bones. The, the tricky thing is that, you know, the, Maybe you have a dog who jumped off a high, you know, deck or something like that. They come in, you take x-rays. They're not, they, you know, we're not totally clear. Like there's no obvious fracture. Maybe there's some damage, a damage to the ulnar growth plate, but you don't always know for sure until a few weeks to months down the line when that growth plate has shut down and you can actually see it radiographically. And so definitely it's one of those things where if owners are starting to notice it, they should certainly try to come in and talk to you as soon as possible because the longer this persists, and especially if you see this injury, if it starts in a younger dog, it's just more and more time, you know, the more they grow, the more damage they could be doing to their joints. Um, and the important thing is that they're not just doing damage to their carpus, but that one that we actually worry about even more so is the elbow. And so you can see in this dog, this dog has a normal left and an abnormal right. And the ulnar growth plate was shut down at some point in time, we have curvature of the radius, we have an ulna, which is almost dislocated from the rest of the joint. Um, and this dog is probably, you know, this dog was probably growing for months to develop this type of incongruity. And so typically when we see a dog like this, the first thing we're going to do is try to protect the elbow as much as possible, because that is a much harder joint to kind of get back to normal function after there's been a lot of damage compared to the carpus. Here's a dog, this is a much less severe incongruity. Um, this one had a small radial step. Uh, we made a cut in the ulna, and you can see when that healed, now it has a nice congruent elbow. So as far as you know, surgical decision-making, and you know, when we see these dogs kind of deciding what's the, the best course for them, you know, if we're seeing these dogs and it's a one-year-old lab, and maybe it has a mild carpal valgus, um, but the dog gets around really well, the elbow looks normal, the owner doesn't really notice the lameness, they just think the dog looks a little funny. Maybe you don't need to rush in and perform a big surgery on this dog if they're comfortable and doing well. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes we do, we do catch dogs in, in this stage where they, you know, doing a surgery just to make it look a little bit more straight might not be the best option for this dog. Certainly when we see younger dogs, the ones that are more clinically affected, that are very lame, ones that have a lot of growth remaining and just have time to do more damage, those are the ones that we try to intervene on and certainly sooner rather than later. Um, some of these guys will end up needing more than one surgery just because things will change kind of dynamically over time. At first we may try to, you know, cut the ulna to allow the, the joint or the, the bones to grow and realign themselves normally. But if that doesn't work, then we have to come back and do a more corrective surgery where we realign the joint, whether that's with um, you know, a plate or an X-fix, you know, in addition to other um, ulnar releasing procedures. Another one that we'll, we'll rare, more rarely see is car puppy carpal disease, so either laxity syndrome or instability or you know, hypoflexion or hyperflexion. So typically for a puppy, 180 to 190 degrees is normal. And we can sometimes see this in puppies six to 16 weeks. Treatment for this, you know, 95% of the time or more is just going to be conservative management. And the things that we'll typically tell owners to do, you know, encourage exercise, encourage paw use. So give them a Kong with some peanut butter in it, have them play with the Kong, use their, their carpus and their paws to, to move around and, you know, stretch those muscles. Sometimes uh, we'll switch them to an adult diet. Um, I haven't done a lot of splinting, but some people will recommend splinting for these, especially the hypoextension ones where you need to kind of progressively change the splint every week or two to get them to stretch out that limb.
This one will often catch incidentally, and we typically don't worry too much about, um, although it can become a problem. This is something called a retained cartilaginous core. The, this most commonly we see in the ulna, and it's basically this flame sign that we see coming up from the ulnar growth plate. Again, many times this is incidental, and we don't worry about treating it, but it can lead to signs similar to basically what we would see for that premature physal closure, uh, where they can have a valgus deformity or a short or ulna. And so if this is something you see, the dog is otherwise normal, it would probably be something where I would have the owner keep an eye out for um, any changes as far as limb alignment goes, but I, you know, not something that I would necessarily refer or worry about right away. And then this one, so puppy swimmer syndrome, this again, we don't see very commonly, um, or maybe we just don't see them very commonly at a referral setting, but maybe you're seeing them more commonly in practice. Uh, certainly we're seeing puppy, you see puppies between one and two weeks of birth. Um, it's often coincided with pectus excavatum, which is that, that inward deviation of the, um, the sternum. Um, these puppies sometimes will have decreased range of motion. And really what they need is rehab and physical therapy and it needs to be done fairly quickly in their lives. And this kind of involves, you know, helping them stand, increasing, you know, doing range of motion exercises, increasing support, Sometimes we'll put hobbles on them to keep their, their limbs under them. And you can see improvement within a few weeks, but this is certainly one of those things where you need a very dedicated owner and someone who's willing to you know, put the time in and work with these puppies. Um, there are definitely a whole host of other diseases that we can see in young dogs. Some of them are, are malformations and different things. And I, I think in the notes slides, I did include a bit more information about these. Um, and just some general guidelines. I would say, especially for the, you know, the different deformities that we can see, a lot of it, the treatment, a lot of it depends on how clinical they are. Um, you know, if, if they're, certainly the, the treatment varies widely, you know, based, based on what's going on. Um, you know, if the dog in the, on the left image who's missing part of its limb, maybe that needs to get fit with the prosthetic, the one in the middle, you know, if, if one of those um, digits and metacarpals is being damaged or caught on a fence and they're having problems with it, maybe you need to be amputated. Maybe the dog's getting around fine and it doesn't matter and they can live their whole life with that. Um, the one on the, the far end on the right, that's a dog with a congenital elbow luxation. Sometimes these dogs don't care and get around fine. Um, sometimes they need surgery. Certainly you can never make that go back to normal, but I think, you know, you have to, again, for these, you know, more rare, rare cases that we see kind of judge treatment based on how they're doing clinically and how would the owner perceive as their quality of life. All right, um, so that's all the slides I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Type any questions into the chat or into the Q&A feature. All right, uh, Dr. Belzano. Do you see uh, the question from, uh, yes. from Lisa? In the really chat. good the physical therapy. Um, very good question. So I, as with everything in veterinary medicine and especially in orthopedics, you're going to get a lot of varied opinions from different people um, as far as rehab goes and treatment and when to recheck and what to do afterwards. For I would say that for dogs, young dogs with joint fractures and injuries, I definitely encourage them to do rehab, mostly because you want to keep those joints mobile, like do range of motion exercises, those kinds of things, because they can certainly get locked up and lose a lot of range of motion, even over four to six weeks of healing. For long bone fractures, I usually don't do, um, I, I think it's beneficial, but I don't worry as much about it. Um, we still want to do it for all of our TPLOs, and I think it's beneficial there. So uh, I think it varies on the case, and the, the opinion will sort of vary depending on who you're talking to. But I certainly, at least for, I can say personally that for those joint injuries, those are definitely the ones where I like them to 
when we were doing rehab. Okay. I saw that question pop up, Phil, but I can't access it. <laughs> this is from Angela. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, it is a great team there. <laughs> yes. Elizabeth really do an amazing job. I think I, <laughs> I when when we get referrals for any orthopedic procedure, I really encourage them to go through rehab. Um, it's not just the the work and the ex exercises that they do with them, but the the frequent check ins. You know, following your orthopedic patients out. You know, just for a TPLO, we'll see them at two weeks, at four weeks, then I'll see them at six, and then we'll see them both at ten. And I think that constant follow up really improves the outcome of our patients versus just doing surgery and then seeing them in ten eight to ten weeks for recheck X rays. Um, the the follow up helps us to intervene if there's you know problems along the way. Yeah. 